Greetings pet lovers, Bridget here with First Street Pets and today we're going to talk about proving pet ownership. Proving that you own a pet may seem simple and basic, but it really is quite complicated and it may not be what you think. This is the sort of thing you won't think about until you have a problem. In my work in shelters and rescues and with Mission Reunite, helping people find lost pets, I have come across many, many, many cases of disputes between different owners of pets. So when are some of the times this may happen? Well, if an animal ends up in a shelter and there may be more than one owner coming forward to claim it, who is the actual owner? How do you prove that? Many times animals become a pawn in a divorce or any kind of a separation between partners that one person wants to keep the animal, so does the other one. They can't agree on who's going to do what, and some of these cases end up going to court. How does the judge prove who is the owner? I have seen some really sad cases where the owner went away to the military and left their pet in the care of a trusted friend or relative, supposedly on a temporary basis until they could return. And while they were away and helpless to do anything about it, that trusted person gave the pet away, surrendered it to a shelter. And when the person came back, they were unable to find their pet again. And it's just heartbreaking. There are other situations where someone may have been arrested. They may go to jail. There's a lot of things that happen. There's no reason to judge people, but they still have a right to keep their pets and to have the opportunity to give them back if they were under someone else's care. You see a lot of cases in the news recently because microchipping has been around for a while of cats where someone's cat disappears, whether they got out and escaped or they were an outdoor access cat. Someone else picks up the cat, believes that it's been abandoned and keeps it. And then five or even 10 years later, you see in the news that the cat ended up in a shelter, was scanned for a microchip. Turns out that they have another owner. So there's a lot of different situations where this may happen and where there may be more than one person who wants that pet, how do you prove ownership? So the first question is, who makes that determination? Who gets to decide who is the owner of the pet? Well, that depends on the situation. If the dog or cat or other kind of animal is in an animal shelter, that's usually decided by the shelter staff who are doing the reclaims for the owners. If it becomes difficult, it may be handed over to some sort of management in the shelter. But generally, these people aren't authority figures. They're simply the shelter staff making a decision that they feel is the right one for whatever reason or is best for that pet. In most cases of pet ownership disputes, the authorities, whoever they may be, police, sheriff, animal control, will usually say it's a civil matter and they won't get involved. And that is fair because it kind of is but in some cases they do get involved and i have seen some situations where the police or animal control officer did get involved in some disputes where it was clear at least to them who the rightful owner was sometimes this matter may be decided in a court and i will link some articles about actual court cases in the description and in my written article that will follow this video there is one case that really jumps out at me that was in the news, a dog named Gigi in San Diego, whose owners divorced. They could not agree who was going to take the dog. They ended up spending over $150,000 in legal fees to decide who would get the dog. I believe that the wife ended up getting possession of the dog after spending $150,000 and over two years in court. So there's a lot of different ways that that decision can be made and it may cost you a lot of money. So let's talk about the kinds of proof and how effective they are. Number one, microchipping. Many people believe that the microchip is proof of ownership and it does go a long way in showing ownership or at least who owned the pet at the time the microchip was registered. Now I will reference below my other videos on microchipping because it's a very complicated system that you need to understand how to get your pet chipped and properly registered. So be sure to check those out. The microchip does not definitively or legally prove ownership. This can be an issue when an animal comes into a shelter. Sometimes 
the chip is registered to two different people, maybe a current owner and a former owner from a couple of years ago. The chip may be registered in more than one registry, so there could be two people claiming ownership. Now, often in shelters, they're happy to have anybody come in to claim the pet, whether it's the current or former owner, and of course, they'll do their best to determine who is the rightful owner, but once in a while, you do get two people coming in trying to claim the same animal, and that's when things get sticky. One of the reasons that I see that the microchip is not a definitive legal proof of ownership is that, as I describe in my other videos, anyone with the chip number can register it. You don't have to show any kind of proof that the pet belongs to you. If you have the number, you can register it. So there is a potential for someone to find or take an animal, get the animal scanned and get the number and go ahead and register the chip and say it's theirs without any sort of legal process of taking over ownership of that animal. So that said, I do recommend every dog and cat be chipped and registered. It does help, but it's not 100% proof. Number two, registration papers. So many people believe that registration, such as the AKC, the American Kennel Club, or any other number of registration organizations, can prove ownership. Having that paperwork showing that this particular dog or other animal belongs to you proves ownership. Now, it may, again, in some cases, help your case. However, these organizations are very quick to say that they are registration organizations, not policing organizations. In fact, the AKC has what they call a self-help guide to dog ownership disputes. And it states right on their website, AKC registration is not legal title to a dog and the AKC itself cannot settle ownership disagreements. So they're not going to get involved, it's up to you. Now that said, if you have registration paperwork for your pet, if you have a purchase agreement from a breeder or other party, definitely keep all that paperwork in a file. All of this stuff helps, although again, it's not 100% proof. Number three, shelter or rescue adoption paperwork. Now, I'm getting ready for someone to throw something at me through that screen, but there is no such thing as adopting a pet. Oh, hold on. Legally, animals are property. I know, we don't feel that way. They're members of the family, and we adopt them into our homes. However, legally, they are considered property and an adoption is the sale of property. You can call it adoption all you want, but it's not the same as adopting a child, a human being. So having this paperwork can prove that you did adopt, purchase, whatever you want to call it, the animal on that date, especially if it's fairly recently. This is a good indicator that this is your animal in your care and you have rights to ownership. However, again, it's not 100%. None of these things are going to be 100%. However, I do recommend that you hang on to any paperwork you have because it may help you should there be a dispute. Some shelters have waiting periods to determine if there is a previous owner who wants to claim the pet, and I'm not talking about the legal hold period. For example, one of the shelters I used to work with had a 30-day period where the adopter was advised that the owner could potentially still come forward and claim the pet. Many shelters don't want to deal with this because they don't want to get involved in sticky situations like that. They just say after the whole period, you've lost your rights to the animal. But I felt that that was a good policy because what if I were out of town and my dog or cat got lost, taken into a shelter, adopted out within a few days, I would lose all rights to get my animal back. So I think that's a good policy. Number five, tags or license or collar with your phone number on it. All of these things are highly recommended. I'm not a fan of collars on cats. However, I believe that every dog should be wearing a collar unless they're built in such a way that it's gonna fall off or there's some medical reason for them to not wear it. My dogs have collars with the phone number actually embroidered on it. I got them on Amazon, they're very inexpensive. You can get any number of tags. The thing is, of course, collars can fall off or be taken off. Now, a license tag is usually required by your jurisdiction. It shows proof that your dog has been vaccinated from rabies and the fees help support the shelter and the animal control department. I have seen the license play a part in some pet reclaims because it's an ID, but it also shows the local animal control agency that you have been paying the fees 
for this animal. And so you are claiming it as yours. So again, not a hundred percent, but that will go a long way. So it's a good idea to keep your license current for your dog and to have them wearing a collar with ID at all times and make sure those tags are current. I have seen people put old rabies tags and old license tags on a dog for whatever reason that aren't current or the tag has a phone number that's no good for them make sure that, that information is current or it's not doing you any good. Number six, possession or care and custody. So the saying goes that possession is nine tenths of the law and this can come into play in a pet ownership dispute. Generally, if someone has been caring for the animal for a period of time, weeks, months, years, they are considered the owner, even if there was never any formal process of taking ownership, such as purchase or adoption from a shelter or rescue. The crux of this is how you obtained the animal. If you found an animal as a stray, made a good effort to find an owner and didn't, and then kept the animal, you are pretty much covered. However, if you found an animal and can't produce any proof that you looked for the owner, that owner comes forward later to get their pet back, they may have a case against you. Of course, if it really is their pet, you should be giving it back anyway. But if you did your due diligence, if you called the shelter, if you made a lost report, if you put up signs, posted on next door, et cetera, et cetera, then you have made a reasonable effort to find that owner. I briefly mentioned the hold periods already for shelters. The laws for shelters in most states are very antiquated. For example, in California, the minimum hold period is 72 hours. In other states, it can be up to maybe five or six days, something like that. Some shelters may voluntarily hold longer, but generally they have so many animals incoming that they have to roll them in and roll them out. They can't be holding animals for weeks in an attempt to find an owner. However, those laws typically don't apply to private individuals rather than a shelter that takes in strays for the city or the county. Now, the laws around this are super vague, and I'll give you an example. Here's the civil code in California for a private individual finding a pet. So this is from the California Civil Code. It says enacted in 1967 and amended in 1998 concerning rescued domestic animals owner to be informed. That's what it says. Any person who finds a thing lost is not bound to take charge of it unless the person is otherwise required to do so by contract or law, etc., etc. Any person who finds and takes possession of any personal property or saves any domestic animal from harm shall within a reasonable time inform the owner if known. That's it, within a reasonable time. I'm paraphrasing and I'll include this uh, information in the written article in its full length. But that's it, it says you must inform the owner if known within a reasonable time. Well, what is reasonable? Three days, a month, three months? So super vague. I'd be curious to know what the laws are in your state around that and how they differ from the laws for shelters. Number six, vet records. Vet records, again, are not 100% proof that you are a pet's owner because anybody can take an animal to the vet when they found, one that belongs to somebody else, etc. But it's a pretty good indicator. Most people won't have vet records, especially dating back for any time period, if that animal has not been in their care and possession for some time. You're not going to spend money on an animal usually that doesn't belong to you. So vets don't like to get involved in ownership disputes because they do come up sometimes, especially concerning microchips. This is why most vets won't take in strays. They won't scan for microchips unless you specifically ask them to, because then if they find the pet has another owner, what are they going to do? They really, they, they're not animal control and they don't want to get involved. So in those cases, you will want to keep your vet records or if you can call your vet and have something printed, if you need to show it as proof of ownership, especially if there's a lengthy history, if it's been years that you've had a pet and you've taken them in for care and vaccines and whatnot. Again, not 100%, but pretty good indicator that you are the owner of that pet. And this is what a lot of shelters like to see as proof of ownership is veterinary records or veterinary invoices. 
Number seven, photos. So in today's world, everyone, even your grandmother probably has a phone that can take pictures. So everyone has pictures of their pets. If someone claims that a pet is theirs and they can't come up with a single picture, that's generally suspect. I was involved in a situation a couple of years ago with a McNabb puppy where the dog was found by one person, given to another person, and then several different people came forward saying it was their dog. And none of those people had any kind of proof. That was a weird situation. Usually you have a hard time finding an owner, but because this was potentially a valuable puppy, there were a number of people who wanted it and claimed to be the owner. Well, who turned out to be the real owner sent us a picture of the dog slightly younger, but it was clearly that dog, clearly those markings, very distinctive. So it was obvious from the pictures taken in their home that that dog belonged to that person. So we microchipped the dog for them and gave her back. And now they have additional proof with the microchipping. But photos are a good idea to always keep in your phone, not just for showing ownership, but also if your pet becomes lost, you can show the picture to people. You can use it to post on Nextdoor or Facebook or to make signs or whatever you're doing to find your lost pet. So it is a good idea to keep photos Although again, like all the other methods, not 100%. So to wrap it up, it goes without saying that prevention is key to keeping your pet safe or to preventing most other problems in life. Try to keep your pets secure, have ID on them at all times, microchips, collars and tags for dogs. I advise you to keep all these kinds of records, even though no, no particular one of them is 100% proof. They will all help your case if this ever comes up. And another thing to be sure of, if it's not the case of say a lost pet or a pet that ends up in a shelter, if you're talking about a split with a spouse or leaving a pet to be cared for with a family member, it's a good idea to have really clear and preferably written arrangements. I know that may seem weird if you're asking your aunt to take care of your cat or dog, but you know, it doesn't hurt. Even if you have a series of text messages or emails, that could be a better proof that an arrangement was made and that you didn't intend to surrender the pet, that the arrangement was temporary. But again, just good communication. I think a lot of these situations come up where someone agrees to take the pet and then after a while they become resentful. It becomes too much for them. It drags on for weeks and months and maybe even years. So there needs to be good communication between you and the person caring for your pet. And if you honestly can't care for your pet anymore, if you aren't working, if you're moving into a place that doesn't take pets, then you may consider surrendering either to someone you know or to a rescue group or someone you can rely on to keep the pet or find a good home for it. If you know realistically that you're not going to be able to get them back in a reasonable amount of time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been helpful. I would really like to hear from you if any of you have been involved in any kind of a dispute with a pet, whether with a family member, a partner or ex-partner or a shelter, please, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Thank you.